Hello there, welcome back to Cinema Flex Music Picks. I'm Davey, your host with the most, the beast with the least. Well, at least we can do today is a, is a review of Marillion's Season's End Deluxe Edition. And look, it's Season's End, can't you tell? Maybe you can't. Um, because when this was released, um, and the new artwork was unveiled, I said, and I did it on Facebook, like most people with far too many opinions, I said, I don't like this. This is change. And I don't like change. I like things the way they were. Three, two, one. And hopefully it's sunk into you that that's very much the theme of this album. It's the first album, of course, with Steve Hogarth. And people, some people, put your hands up if you were one of them and now aren't, did say, I don't like change. I don't like this new guy. I want the old guy back. Where's Fish? This guy doesn't even have a funny name. Steve. I want fish. Well, Derek's not that funny either, but I suppose his surname's a little bit funny, isn't it? Um, Dick. Um, how juvenile. Um, but the essence of this whole package is very much change. Change and renewal. Regeneration, Doctor Who terms. I'm going to go into it. Um, so first of all, um, Michael Hunter's done the 2023 remix. I'll, I'll, I'll do a vision on here and just flick through the, the book while, while I'm yammering on. Um, Michael Hunter's done this remix and by gum, is it good? Straight away, you know that it's a new version, but it's a sympathetic version. It's a 1989 album. But it is not a 1989 mix. It very much is... Oh no. Mark. Thank goodness you embraced the Lex Luthor look. That is, that is, that is a disgrace. And I say some, that is somebody that wears this about. Um, it's very much a 1989 album. But Michael Hunter's remix gives it a, a polish rather than anything else. It's that little bit of silver that's been away in the cupboard and it just needs a polish more than anything else. It doesn't need to be melted down and, and built back up into something new. It's all it's lovely as it is. It just needs a little spit polish. And that's what he does here. So you get, from the moment it kicks into um, the King of Sunset Town, you get an idea that this is very much a... Uh, more spacious, and that's that's a bit of a cliche when talking about remixes, but it's a more spacious mix um, with the things you can do with separation these days, and it's more sympathetic certainly to the rhythm section, so Pete and Ian, you can hear a lot more, and a lot more clearly um, in certain places where they were previously buried in the mix quite a bit, and I've stopped there because, look, there's your album covers we've known it for all these years and here's the new one so well we want that we want that but we've got this we're very much an allegory i think if that was intentional it's genius to make us say this is change and i don't like change and if they didn't tend that and i've come up with it as a just a clever deduction praise for me it's proper review and stuff that is um but yeah, the the album, it's, I mean, you don't need me to review the records, um, but Easter, for example, Rother's legendary guitar solo on that. Now, not only do you hear that legendary guitar solo, but it sounds 100 times clearer, and you get to hear the band be more sympathetic to it in the background as well. Um, things that were previously... Mm, 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 you now go, mmm. Um, and here they are, looking very, mmm, kind of Levi's advert. And Mark has very sensibly worn a baseball cap. Oh, it's all going a bit status quo there, hasn't it? Forever in blue jeans. So we know the story as fans. Um, Fish leaves and uh, just about the time of the mixing of the Thieving Magpie live record. Um, they have to come up with something very quickly for EMI because they don't have the luxury of time because EMI told them they want a record. 
Um, Fish is being given the luxury of time because Fish is the golden boy at EMI. They think he's the breakout star. That's gorgeous artwork. He's the breakout star. Um, These are just the guys that were his backing band. So they need to prove themselves. So they need to get something to his ASAP. Fish, can he can have some time. Um, That looks like Fugazi, doesn't it? Um, so, as we know, Fish wouldn't release an actual album until 1991, whereas this came out in 89. Um, and they would have another record out by, the, by that point as well, um, Holidays in Eden, which uh, came out last year as a, a deluxe set. Very much a case of um, audition, audition, audition. Um, the band were auditioning, of course, singers. Um, and when H does get the okay you can do this album he's still very much auditioning the guys he's still very much deciding whether or not he does want to uh, just stay with his then gig which was touring as a keyboard player with the the or he wants to give it all up and become a milkman and have a more stable existence and just a just a regular job I was going to say 9 to 5 job but I don't think milkmen work 9 to 5 well, I'm way to make a living for the milkman. Um, so he's auditioning them, they're auditioning him, and then EMI are auditioning a lot of them, because EMI, as I said, they have um, no regard for Marillion, really. Um, it's all the Fish show, and now they've got Fish as a solo artist. They have the chance to draw up Marillion um, at any point, if they just don't like what's going on. So Marillion had to essentially start, not quite all over again, because they obviously had the reputation of at least having success in the past, but they had to prove that, hey, we've got a new commercial sound that can sell you loads of records. Well, you know, not selling out. This set goes into the process um, of how they deliberated over how we're going to get a new singer, Shall we be Marillion? Well, of course we shall. I think that conversation lasted about five minutes where they were kind of debating, are we still Marillion? Should we have a new name? Or, And then they said, no, no, Fish left. We didn't. We're still together. We're Marillion. We made the music. Um, so it was very much a case of, right, new person comes in. New guy or girl comes in. Been interesting if they get a girl, wouldn't it? Um, and the idea... Um, to get the new singer in was unfortunately a bit of a timing problem they had to come up with songs before the new singer was going to be able to to actually work with them on coming up with a whole new project so H Steve Hogarth um, comes in and things are a bit fait accompli um, and that's not the way he kind of liked it he wanted more of a process stay in the process but as we know he would get that. He would get that luxury further on down the line, but still very much on tenter hooks as to whether or not that was going to be the case. And um, was he just going to be the hired hand? In here, um, in the booklet itself, they have an expression for it. Um, where let's see. Uh, yes, Poundland. Poundland singer. Poundland replacement singer. They could very easily, and they go into this in the documentary, have gotten a guy that sounded like Fish. They auditioned um, Alan Reed from Palace um, and about 300 other people, including Cliff Richard backing singers and, um, oh, um, what's his name that was working with Giza Butler? Um, Carl, Carl Santans, something like that. Um, auditioned also and Carl thought he had the gig um, he was there for about a week and then was told sorry your services will not be required um, however Steve Hogarth had also turned down his tape and the band listened and I think Mark knew the U- the Europeans vaguely and they were already kind of sympathetic to well this guy sounds like he could do our stuff but also create new stuff and he's got a good look He's got a good commercial voice, but he's also got something that could be vaguely progish, you know, to appeal to, you know, the older fans and uh, also to do justice to some of the old material. 
and it worked out rather well, didn't it? It worked out rather well. As we know, um, 34 years on, they're still making great new music and Marillion have continued line up unabated ever since. The only fly in the ointment they probably thought at the time was when EMI dropped them um, in the mid 90s. But even that didn't stop them because although this goes into it, they were kind of scared about getting dropped by EMI because no guarantees they were going to get picked up by anybody else, the internet comes along and no band this early embraces the internet to not just not just crowdfund but build a relationship with your fan base um, to encourage your fan base to become if not part of the band and certainly part of the crew um, they've used crowdfunding for insurance purposes they've used it to fund whole albums um, as far back as the 90s um, and this very much is the change album which is going to lead to that because as we know their fortunes their fortunes with H in the band would never ever ever rise to the heights commercially of uh, childhood end which is what EMI were always chasing they always wanted more Kayleys they always wanted more Lavenders they didn't want Brave you know, they didn't want that kind of thing um, but Marillion didn't really know how to be anything else but Marillion um, so eventually when they do fly solo they soar they absolutely soar but yeah that's a story for another day um, this is jam packed you get the Michael Hunter remix you get a live show that was recorded last year in which they do the album in its entirety along with um, look at that Oh, there's only two tracks on that CD. What a rip-off. Well, it's Gaza and the Leavers, so I think you know how long that'll be. Um, when the album's done it's in, in its entirety, they do the release in between After Me, which is one of my favourite Merlion songs. It's so beautiful. And Hooks and You, which is one of the most heavy Merlion tracks. Um, I always remember seeing the Top of the Pops performance of uh, Hooks and You. And it's, it's got one of those. It's a Kid Jensen. One of those cheesy introductions of, and now here's Marillion with a new guy singing up front. So, it's funny how the weird top of the pops presents a stick in your mind. And um, if only weird was the worst thing you could say about some of the top of the pops presenters, eh? Um, so, yeah, so this two and three are um, CDs of the live concert from last year. Here's the cool stuff, though the Blu ray. This is all the Blu ray. You get the new mix from Michael Hunter, You get which is in 5.1. You get all sorts of demos, B-sides, um, and early versions, which includes um, different versions of String Groove, with, since, without, Amsterdam, which is an early version of uh, The Space. The Space is one of my favourite Merlin kind of eerie tracks. Kind of sounds spooky. Um, you get... The M8 um, dictaphone version of Sunset Town, not even called King of Sunset Town at that point, where H just recorded into dictaphone on the M8. Um, you get um, yeah demos for pretty much the full record and all sorts of B-sides. Um, so you get the B-sides and you get the demos for the B-sides, etc, etc, etc. You then get the Montreal bootleg from uh, Le Spectrum, 2nd and 3rd February 1990 in which it's wonderfully sequenced they do it's like they give you a little taste of fish era and then say okay that was to kind of keep you quiet now listen to the new stuff and then just as maybe the fans are saying oh new stuff I'm not sure but they give you a bit more fish era stuff it's wonderfully sequenced you'll see what I mean um, The King of Sunset Town slash your maths grip for Jeffrey's tear the uninvited guest, Easter, Walmart Circles. That time of the night, uh, Holy Girl, Berlin, Season's End, so it's always like, mm, too much new stuff, so what do you do? Kelly and Lavender, back to back, Heart of Lothian to follow. And then you say, but this is our era, so what's your encore? Hooks and You and The Space. Yeah, so very much a clever set list, a clever set list to say, Right, we need to get our new music into their brains 
but we also can't lose them by having nothing they're familiar with. We've built up a decade of goodwill at this point nearly, we can't lose too much of that. But we also need to tell them that literally, change, 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 change. And speaking of, you get a documentary here called Seasons Change. Seasons Change is the, every one of these releases on this series has had it, is the making of, um, it's the definitive documentary of this album, but not just the album, but the period itself. So it goes into all the, what we're going to do about the singer situation, what we're going to do about the songs, what if EMI drop is. Um, it goes into all that, it goes into the compositions, it goes into the studio and how they, um, you know, are we going to try and radically be different? Are we going to try and really change things up? What if this doesn't work out? Um, etc 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 all their fears and anxieties and how close they really were to to EMI just one person at EMI saying no nah, no nah, we've got fish we're okay and it could have been the end of Merlin it really could have and they could have been a a great bunch of session players for the next 34 years instead of Merlin thank god things worked out the way they did that documentary is brilliant. If you've been following the uh, documentary series on these releases, this is one of the best of them. Um, from And then you get, this was so cool, they included these two. Fans will have them from VHS and DVD, but um, Rocksteady, um, the concert film from 1990 in Montreal, um, and the From Stoke Row to Ipanema, half documentary, half concert film kind of thing. Um, and that's been on DVD as well and VHS. From Stoke Road to Ipanema is very much the propaganda version of the new documentary Seasons Change. So when Seasons Change, when they go into, you know, EMI could drop us at any time and we were on tenterhooks and mm, all a bit scary and we're not sure about the new guy and the new guy's not sure about us and, and H is saying and I wasn't sure about them and they weren't sure about me and we weren't sure about producers, we weren't sure about sounds, music's changing all around us, and are we changing enough, should we change, all sorts of anxieties. Well, From Stoke Road to Ipanema is essentially a, a document from the tour um, and covers all that up. You wouldn't know it if you watched only From Stoke Road to Ipanema. You would think that this was a band that just said, ah, to hell with it, everything's going to be great. Everything's grand, we're better than ever, we're bigger than ever, everything's fine. Very much a kind of, nothing to worry about, you know. Not quite needle fiddling while Rome burns, because they were fine. We know that they would stay with EMI for a lot longer than I think they probably reckoned they would. And then once EMI did drop them, it's almost like the internet was just ready for them to, to kind of come along at that point, wasn't it? Um, the way they started using the internet, um, perfect. And then you get promo films for Hooks and You, Easter, and The Uninvited Guest. Um, yeah, and it's, it's just jam-packed. I mean, so what is that? You get four concerts, essentially, then. So you get the Montreal bootleg, um, you get the Rocksteady concert film, the footage from uh, the Eponema, and you get the one from last year on the CDs. That's pretty damn comprehensive. And and you get the all the demos and the new mix. And the Montreal, uh, sorry, and the season change, hour and a half documentary, and the book that I've just flicked through for you as well, all on these discs. And and if you were one of the, as always, first thousand something like that to order, you get uh, you get that signed by the band. That might have been nice if they'd given us the the old album cover there at least signed. But uh, hey, nothing to stop you waiting behind at a gig and trying to get the old album signed if you want. Well, we'll draw it to a close there as we approach the 20 minute mark um, because I'm probably preaching to the choir here, but this is a stunning release of, and I'm sad that the, the project's now over. Um, we've now got all the AMI releases, but they've already dropped hints that uh, they may be doing you know, other things in this vein. Strange engine. Um, Hopefully it'll be in this book format because it would be so nice to have a continuing series beyond this era on our shelves and they know we want that. They know. There's no two ways about it. Um, so, yeah. 
exciting times, hopefully still ahead. There always are with Marillion. Sometimes you wait, but there always are exciting times ahead. Um, so, to everyone at Marillion, from the early days to the end of the EMI year, I thank you very much for this wonderful, wonderful series. Although somebody should have told them you can actually just do these as stickers. The BBFC don't need you to, to actually put them on the covers. You can have them as stickers. However, it's a bit late in the game to tell them that now, isn't it? Uh, so yes, thank you very much for, for your attention. Um, and by the way, caution, there is infrequent strong language. So be careful. No 11-year-olds should watch this. There's lots of 11-year-olds who will be disappointed by that, but tis what tis. As usual, folks, again, thank you very much for watching. Stay very safe out there. Comments, suggestions, and complaints, especially complaints, down below. And I'll see you tomorrow with another box set that arrived a couple of days ago that I've taken time to really delve into. Um, so I will see you then. You will see me here. And until then, love and indeed mercy.